Proverbs chapter 23. <coughs> Excuse me. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is set before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not derious of his dainties, for they are deceitful me. And these, these three verses is, the warning is when you're sitting before somebody of authority and they're not right with God, and food is put out before you, and you have a big appetite, it'd be better if you just slit your throat than eat with somebody who has no good in mind. That would be that would be of any Christian today if they are invited to the White House. There would be of no good for the leaders of this nation to sit down and want to talk to you rightfully. It's a table is spread out. They're, they're, it's like giving a, a a turkey right around this time a whole bunch of food, fatten them up for the killing. Labor not to be rich. So you're to labor, but not to be rich. You are to do a job, a career, but not to be rich. You know, you can enter the medical field, and you can do it to help the Lord and others and you can do it not to be rich over and over 23 chapters we are in now if you were to study the book of James uh, one of the chapters in Timothy talks about listen it is not wrong to be rich a Christian can be rich but there's definitely something wrong with being rich there is a Bible warning money and possessions can attack you and steal you away from God I've got something coming up where they know I am in church Sunday morning. And yet they want to push me to be there at, to work. You know, you're getting the money, you're getting the hours. That's not important. you got six other days to, to choose me to come in. Money does not answer everything. And when you die and are put into that hole in the ground, you can take nothing with you. And I've heard and seen, you know, funerals where, where that guy's car was buried, you know, he was buried with the car and, you know, sitting inside the car. Well, that car is not with him in eternity. It's rotting in wherever the hole, where he was buried. Pharaohs prove you can't take it with you because the stuff they own is sitting in one or two places in a museum or somebody who has stole its living room the Bible says what will you give for exchange for your soul he tells the, the rich man in in the gospel of Luke yeah you got everything but tonight you fool you, you it's death and we are brought up with the thing in America today, and I'm not against education, I'm not against a career, but aim for the best, go for the top. And today we were uh, we were listening and the things with Jockey Robinson, Babe Ruth, ball players who were in sports and they accomplished these great feats in sports beyond a shadow of a doubt and they didn't do it with steroids 
and yet we live in a modern America with, with, with computer technology and, and, and medicine and, and great things today, and our sports people do what they do under drugs and steroids. For every 99, there's suspicion, and there may be that one that did it by fate and by, by means of his own thing without an outside abusement substance, but that is rare. We are so much into riches and fame that we will do anything to destroy our body if possible to get we will step on people, we will kill people, we will talk about people, we will lie about people, we will do everything to our fellow American to gain for riches. And the Bible says labor not to be rich. It will destroy you. Paul had nothing but a parchment and a couple books. Sitting in jail, being chained to a man who has to listen to him now, and had more joy. And what you don't see, I'm going to close with his riches, is if you don't see what their private life is. Oh, you might see him on the camera fixed up. You know, you know they sit in front of this mirror with, with, with uh, light bulbs, and somebody comes up and powders their face. Somebody fixes them up. They don't look like that. And when it's quarter time to go to bed, what is their life? What's their medication? What is their drink? What are they smoking? See, you don't see it all. The Bible warns us about being rich. Because it's something to be warned about. It is something about that power and prestige that the Bible just warns you about. Now, can you be a Christian and be rich? Yes, you can. But it's a warning. Cease from thy own wisdom. Now, what's that? I mean, we've been talking about wisdom, 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 wisdom. What are we talking about? Man's wisdom, not God's. Is it wrong for a Christian to go to, to a, a worldly college? No, but understand that you in college has to take classes that does not pertain to the study that you're doing. And those electives or mandatory classes, whatever they call them, some of them will try to turn your faith of God to man. Philosophy, evolution, science are out there today in the college to turn you away from God. And that's when you're not to trust thy own wisdom. And that wisdom, to, you know, I'm going to get that career, I'm going to be rich, and you also destroyed your life by turning away from God and believing something that man has. There's a way that seems right unto the man, but the, the ways thereof, I mean, the, the ends thereof is death. Wilt thou set thy eyes upon that which is not? Not what? Anything. Realize when you are lying in that casket, or lying at the bottom of the ocean, or on dead on top of a mountain, wherever your body is lying dead, your soul is somewhere in eternity, either heaven or hell. And if it's not done for Christ, it is not. It is nothing. Everything done in self, for self, your own wisdom, will not get you to heaven. 
will not earn you a crown at the judgment seat of Christ. Will not get you the right to the right to inherit a a position in the millennium under Jesus Christ. You can have it all today. And that's the truth. And yet you can lose it all in the eternity. You can damn your soul in, in the lake of fire by not turning to God's wisdom. You can walk around in New Jerusalem without a crown when you choose to serve yourself. For riches certainly make themselves wings, and they fly away as an eagle towards heaven, the most highest altitude that any creature that God made on this earth, the highest that can go without technology, without the airplanes and spaceships, is the eagle. The eagle can dwell where man cannot. That first heaven is where the eagle flies, where the clouds are. And if you ever seen the picture of of money having wings and flying? Yeah, my money talks to me. It says bye bye. That's where they got it right there. Proverbs 23, verse 5. You bet you they didn't know that, did you? Every time they show money flying off with wings. Where, where, where did they get the idea to draw that right out of a Bible? And they don't even know it. You know, you don't get wings when you die. Your money does. And it flies away from you. In the next great worldly event that's going to happen, the tribulation period, you're not going to have money. Did you know that? Your money will be put bye-bye. See you later. Your currency will be 666 on your forehead or your right, arm, right hand. Say goodbye to money. Money's going bye-bye. Do you realize you take the richest men in America? You take the top five richest men in the world. And the rapture were to happen right now. And if the tribulation happens right after the rapture. We don't know. But let's say the tribulation period begins as soon as the church is gone. Three and a half years, all that money from oil, all that money from the uh, uh, Silicon Valley, all the money from wherever they got their riches from, whether it be Hollywood or what, they won't have it no more. It will be no good. We're coming again to America to a period of time like the Depression. Money ain't going to mean nothing. There was a time in this country that money, that was it. I mean, we had food, but we didn't, the money meant nothing. We're coming to a time in America where money ain't going to mean nothing, and there's going to be no food. You can't grow corn on a paved parking lot. Wheat is not going to grow where a concrete mall is. Yeah, the supermarket may provide you food, but when the land is gone and the land has been polluted and the land has been overpowered by cement, brick, and stone, there will be a time when that grocery store will not produce any more food for you. 
first the produce section, then the meat section, and then you'll just have to live on the canned goods. The Bible suggests a middle class uh, standard. You go to work, you get what you what you do to you for your paycheck, you pay your bill. You try to save something up for your children. There's no sense of yielding up a big bank account. You don't know, thou fool, that tonight may be. you got to be sensible with your money. You've got to have just enough. you got to have a rainy day fund. But just to stock it up, to stock it up, to stock it up, you're not guaranteed a retirement. Who told you that? Listen, to swindle your family so you can have a bank account and die before you're able to withdraw it. And what happiness have you done to your family? Take them out to eat every once in a while. That's not a sin. The Bible says, Paul says, listen, rather if your wife needs be or your husband needs be, instead of giving money to a missionary, you give the money to them to, 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 to do something to please them, make them happy. Because if you're saved, when God brings up your wife and your children to be a testimony against you in that big bank account you had, what's it going to do for you? What happiness? I mean, what happiness when you buy your child a toy? And it's the kind of toy that aggravates the whole family for the rest of the night. But she enjoys it in playing with it. Oh, I'm going to save the money up. And no, 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 no. You got to be right with money. You can go to the far extreme or to the far extreme. Eat thou not the bread of him that has an evil eye. Ooh, ooh, evil eye. Bible speaks. Uh, Deuteronomy 15.9. Yeah, Deuteronomy 15.9. Whether, these little markings I have in my Bible. Some, some, somebody taking my notes and shrunk them down. I don't like know who did that. Neither desire thou his dainty meat. Run that back to verses 1, 2, and 3. You see what the Lord's talking about? You know, God put a little test in there. You know, oh, for the dainty me, I'm done reading. I'm, I read my Bible today. Okay, bye. <laughs> in a couple more verses, you've got the answer. You know, the Bible says, The study to show thyself approved unto, uh, unto God, a man that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You gotta go from here to there, there 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 to there to get the answer. God don't lay it out like that. Uh, uh, what was that book? You know, uh, oh, anxiety, page one forty-seven. How to have children, page ninety-three. Money, page twelve. You know, you should be a commercial. You got this book and this page had all. No, it's not how God works. That ruler had an evil eye towards you. He's not in your best interest. Here's a guy who's not in your best interest. Neither desire thou his dainty meat. For as he thinketh in his heart, what's he thinking about? Can you name some places in the Bible where there have been meals prepared? And someone at that table who's with the meal has an evil eye, Judas, after Satan entered him. Right after Satan entered the Judas, Judas, oh, okay. You know, Judas got upset earlier before that 
when, when Mary's anointing him, oh, that could have been sold for 3,300 uh, pence. You know, he was angry then, and that's when he went to the chief priest. Oh, Herod's having, having his, the, the daughter do a belly dance in front of there. While his wife is over thinking, hey, I'm waiting for that right moment. That, that daughter of mine will please that guy so much I can get the answer to the, the prayer what I want. I want John the Baptist dead. That's my prayer. Go through the Bible and read the places where somebody right after dinner. Naboth, they set up, a, set up a, a fast and a feast for him. And put him up on high. And then they had a couple liars come and lie about him and he's stoned. Better be careful who you eat with. You better listen to me. You better realize all people are not your friends. All people are not Christ lovers. They will stab you as soon as they get the opportunity. And they'll do it in love. I'm telling you. Barely listen. For as he thinks in his heart, evil, verse 6. So is he, evil, verse 6. Eat and drink, saith he today, but his heart is not with me. How many marriages have started off with that one? You know, they, they wine and dine, you know, go ahead and eat. Eat, drink, be merry. And their heart has never been with you. Being used. You know, some marriages are based upon the other the other party was rich. You know, that does happen. The morsel which you ate, which thou hast eaten, shall thou vomit up. It's not good. And there's one thing I avoid is vomiting. I will go through the whole night if I'm sick and I know I need to throw up. I know my body. I will fight the whole thing all night long and lose sleep because I don't want to throw up. And go in the bathroom and throw up and then feel relieved. Throwing up is not one of those things you want to do. And yet, what does the Bible say about our church age? It makes God sick. The things that we feed God with in this church age makes him want to vomit. Revelation chapter 3. Can you picture God wanting to vomit? Can you imagine that moment? Jesus is with his disciples, all 12 of them, in the upper room, and he's having the last supper with them. Oh, excuse me, guys. Oh, ah. What would Peter say to that? And what does God say about this church age? Excuse me. Ah. All the angels had him. What, what, what was that? I know he didn't vomit. Okay, that's good. He didn't vomit, but it makes him want to vomit. You know, false prophets are likened to a dog that will return to its own vomit. Study vomit in the Bible, and you'll find an interesting thing. We're coming across a, a, a drinking at the end of this chapter. You know, the Bible speaks about a bunch of drunken men with a table full of vomit. I thank God I have never got that bad. Man, study vomit in the Bible. You're getting a nice little study. We'll have a message tonight on vomit. <laughs> It'd probably be good, too.
your old time hymnal, your 1611 Bible, and a, and a Bible verse vomit bag. When I said that, someone probably come up with one. Huh? Speak not in the ears of a fool. Wow. Proverbs 9 8, Matthew 7 6. For he will despise the wisdom of thy words. Where did the wisdom come from? If you're witnessing to somebody, came from God. There are some people, you know, the Bible says, don't even speak to them. There are some people right now, they came to me, if I know, I know who they are, I won't say a word to you. Matter of fact, I just made you sarcasm, just try to get you angry. I'm sure not going to give you the words of hope. You've already been given them. You have pulled yourself to be a fool. You are a loser. And the Bible says, speak not in the ears of a fool. There's one guy right now, if I see him again on the street, I'm not. You're going to have to show me that you really searching for God after the time I gave you. Because you are a fool. Listen, the Bible says that the fool in his heart said there's no God. Doesn't John chapter 1 and... I forget that one over there. First John was it four or five? It says the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. That doesn't say that the Word is Jesus Christ. So if you reject Jesus Christ by saying, "Well, men wrote it, wrote the Bible," you're just as much as a fool. Uh, Titus three ten, First Samuel fifteen twenty eight, and First Samuel sixteen one. Now we read about this one in verse 28 last night. Oh, Remove not the old landmark. Proverbs 22, 28, Deuteronomy 19, 14, and 27, 17. And enter not into the fields of the fatherless to dispossess, dispossess that land. Because the, the father who worked, the husband that worked, died. Exodus twenty two twenty two and first Kings twenty one one. The Bible in the law proclaimed you were to help the child the, the fatherless and the widow. You're supposed to give them a little leniency. Even Acts chapter five, they were talking, you know, you're not taking care of the widow. Yeah, there are churches. We're Bible believing churches, and you're not taking care of the widow. Now, Paul explains to Timothy there are characteristics, there are standards for the church to take care of a widow. But the government has taken over. See, the government saw the church was not doing their job, so they gave you Social Security. But then again, they didn't expect you to live past a certain age, so that's why they made that age, and now science has made you live a little longer. Now you upset the whole government system and ain't got no money that they spent on you that you weren't supposed to live. Where the churches were supposed to take care of the widows and not the government. Now, see, that part being rich, labor not to be rich, one of those things, considering not to be rich, not having a little savings account, is you got to think, you know, you got to have a little left, a little more for, for your spouse to survive. Having means for your spouse to live. But then again, most who died in the Bible left a widow who was not taking being to take care of. And God speaks about the widow, hey, take care of her. Because her husband did not provide her a savings account. 
And yet God has never rebuked the husband. But he, re he, he rebukes those who are under him. The church or the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. To take care of them and the fatherless. The church is told for women who meet the application, the standards set by Paul to Timothy, you're to take care of them. But see, there are no godly women being grown up today that can meet those standards. Very few. We don't have godly women being brought up today. Very few. And then you know that verse that says, you know, if you, if you can't, if you don't, if you don't, for your own, if you don't, over there in Timothy, if you have not, I, the word's not coming to my head, I'm sorry. But if you have not taken care of your own, you're worse than an infidel. You know what that verse is really talking about? Read the content. If there are widows in your family, and you're not taking care of them, and you're letting the church take care of them, you're an infidel. You're no better than those that, that go to, hey, Here's my father. And, here's my mother and father's money. Hey, you put it to the to the church, to the temple treasury, and all that. And once they're dead, you can pay me back whatever you know, minus the interest and stuff like that. There was somebody who was supposed to take care of his mother and father, and gave the money to the to the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes, and you know, a little payoff. You knew that happened. But then again, what do you do with a parent that is not going to serve the Lord? If you're not going to serve the Lord and do right, you're not going to live on my roof and I ain't going to take care of you. I've got standards too. The Bible is just it's a hard hammer, but it's the truth, and you stick to it. Remove not the old landmark, we talked about that last night, and enter not in the fields of the fathers, for their Redeemer is mighty. Uh-oh. Redeemer? He shall plead their cause with thee. Uh-oh. You mess with that uh, the the widow there, and you mess with that land of Israel, Old Testament. You got God on your doorstep. You wish God would turn into that death figure and kill you. Oh no 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 no! That land is. Listen, God says that is my land. I'm giving it to you because of Abraham. You better not do any misdealings in that land, which they did, and they were booted out of the land. And they sent them back on Ezra and Nehemiah, and they got right, and then they got wrong, and in Titus 70 AD, and that's not their land today. Oh, yeah, World War One, you know, prepared the land. World War Two prepared the people. Do you think that's their land today? you think they're following God to the fullest today? Go down to the to the, the synagogue that I pass on the way to work. Say, hey, you know, I'm really interested in Jerusalem and all that. When's the next time when's the next feast you guys all pack up and get into the airlines to go to Jerusalem for the feast? And they'll look at you and laugh at you. They don't go over there three times a year like they're supposed to. 
They say that not of a bone of the Passover is to be broken. Yet on the plate, they have a bone. How can you have a bone and not all the bones of the body? Their Redeemer is God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't mess with the Jew. Even though they are wrong, that is God's people. And God says today, I will curse them that curse you and I will bless them that bless you. I know of a missionary, not by name, that is over, well, he's not really a missionary because he can't be a missionary, but he's a Jew that lives over in Israel and is trying to convert the people, you know, in his house and, and on the workplace and stuff like that. I pray for that guy. I love that guy that he loves the Jews to witness to him. Man, when you get God the Redeemer against you, it says he's mighty. How mighty is him? Read Genesis to Proverbs and not Proverbs to Revelation to find out how mighty God is. I don't want to mess with that God. Apply thy heart into unto excuse me instruction and thy ears to the words of knowledge, Second Timothy two fifteen. You're to listen to God. I'm amazed when I sit in a church and the preacher's got a good message going on. I can hear somebody talking. What is more important than you've got to open your big flap jack when the preacher's up there in front? You're supposed to be listening to him. You're not supposed to be talking. Your cell phone goes off. Your cell phone has no business going off in the middle of church. We don't need your clock to go off and tell you, tell us it's 11 or 12 o'clock. Thank you very much. When you got those things going on, it takes your ears off, off the pastor and his message that he has prepared for us. God speaks to the pastor through the word. Withhold not correction from the child. For thou beatest him with the rod. A parent's love he shall not die. If a parent really loves that child, that child is not going to get as much as he deserves. I forget what the set number of Paul says you were to be beat. He says minus one. I think it was 39. I think you're supposed to get 40, but he, you know, I, I think it was supposed to be 39, 40, 40 minus one is 39. Let's say it was 39. I could be wrong. Let's say Paul is lying out before a public executioner to apply the 39 whack. Do you think that executioner that loves Paul so much that, oh, I'm only going to give you 10? I'm not look your back. I'm not going to give you the 39. No, no, that's not the case. That guy is doing a job. He's going to give you the full full benefit of what is supposed to be coming to you. But when a parent looks at their child and says, "I love you," and I, you're going to stop, and the, you know, even though the tears are just crocodile tears, they're not really weird. You're going, and you're going to stop outside of full benefit. A parent's love will keep a child from dying. One of the things you do as a parent when it comes to correction, give, a, give yourself time out to calm down. Thirty, forty-five, sixty minutes later, then call the child in. Explain to him why the punishment is going to happen. And then apply the rod, and you're not going to give full. And if you do, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to whack you. I, I got ten whacks for this crime that you do. Round five, you're going to stop 
the pressure and the and the uh, the fulcrum and you know all those other scientific work, it's going to get a little less. It's going to be a little less pressure. You won't kill that child. If you have God's love and the love as, as a parent, you won't kill that child. You say, why do you say that? Because that's what the world will tell you. Yes, there are parents out there who beat their children and beat them, if not to death, near death. They don't love that child. That wasn't a beating for correction. That's a beating of aggravation or being under a substance. Aggravation or abuse is different from a Bible love of your child and want them to do right and follow Jesus. That they will not walk into a public place with a semi-automatic gun and start firing away. Look what else it says. Now you take the next verse. And you apply that to a children. You apply that to a seven or eight year old girl who stands in front of a street preacher and tells him to shut up. Yang 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 no Jesus and yang yang shut up. I told you to shut up. That girl has not had her little behind corrected. And what is the result? I'm sorry to say that little girl. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shall deliver his soul from hell. Children in America today are most likely to wake up in eternity in the lake of fire because of a lack of correction. What is worse being shot in a schoolroom rather than waking up in hell? And yes, a five, a six, a seven, a eight, a nine, a ten, especially a teenage child knows what sin is and knows the consequences because they try to hide. And that's the moment when they should come to the knowledge of saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the child takes a cookie and runs into the bedroom and shuts the door and looks all around and hides the cookie while eating, knows there's a penalty for sin. That point, that child needs to know about a redeemer. The child needs to know about a payment. The child needs to know about the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Correction will drive a child from hell. Deuteronomy 2120. Can I read my notes here? Pain is for learning. Pain is in medical healing. Now, thank God, I've never had an arm bust or anything. Like that. Uh, I've, I have been told that sometimes that a doctor has to take that bone and has to physically put it back into place, and I guarantee that's probably not comforting. How many of you enjoy to get a, a flu shot where it stings and all that? But that is for your healing. My son, if thy heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. That's the Father. I think we're going to close right there. We'll pick up that one next time. We'll leave off with child punishment. For the good of the child, the Bible says.